You know, if this was a new fad, that'd be one thing. A new fad of eating the kind of diet I recommend, which, for those of you who don't know, is a diet based on starch, like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils, with the addition of fruits and vegetables. In fact, that's a sentence. That, that one sentence, and I'll follow it by another sentence, really describes my program. The McDougal program is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. The second sentence is it contains no animal foods and no free oils. Free oils being like olive oil, corn oil, etc. That's the, that's the McDougal program. Well, that's the kind of diet that we've been living by and teaching for many years. And you need to know that this is not a fad, and that's what this lecture is about, is the fact that this is not a fad. I know you hear about all kinds of different diets out there. You hear about the paleo diet and the Atkins diet and, you know, don't eat very much food diets and all kinds of diets. But the kind of diet that I'm teaching you has a solid history behind it. And the best way for me to share this history with you is to tell you a little bit of how I uh, got involved with it and also introduce you to some of my friends along the way. Mary and I met in 1971 in September at Blodgett Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we were in the operating room. She was an operating room nurse, and I was a senior medical student, and I fell in love <laughs> instantly. It wasn't the same for her, but, you know, it was, uh, it was one of those things where my parents told me when I was growing up, they said, son, when you meet the right woman, you will know if you're honest with yourself. And she certainly wasn't the first woman I'd met. But when I did meet her, I knew she was the right one. And so we met in 19, uh, 1971, September. It took me about three weeks before I could get a date, but I finally did. And then it worked out really well. We were in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is, well, in my opinion, not the most ideal place in the world to live. Better than Detroit, which is where I was raised. But uh, there seemed to be greener pastures for us. And we decided that we were going to leave Grand Rapids, Michigan after my medical school training. But fortunately, something very important happened to me before we left, is I was attending, in the winter of 1971, I was attending a noontime medical conference. Now, noontime medical conferences for medical students are a little overwhelming. And it was really kind of frustrating for me to go to these noontime medical conferences like at Blodgett Hospital and hear the doctors talk about all the ailments of my patients and never really tell me how to get them well. I mean, that's why I became a doctor. My dad always told me, the greatest reward in life, son, is to help other people, and the greatest opportunity to help other people is to be a doctor. And so I was so excited to gain those skills and to share with other people. And unfortunately, I'd go to these noontime conferences, and doctors would talk about the signs and symptoms of disease, the genetic relationships, maybe the possibility of a virus, or when we really got down to it, it was the patient's fault. They were overstressed and neurotic. I never saw a way to help my patients get well until one noontime conference I heard a man called Dr. Dennis Burkett speak. Dr. Dennis Burkett uh, was visiting Battle Creek, Michigan to talk to the Kellogg's Food Company, the cereal maker, and was trying to convince them to feed people more fiber. Dr. Dennis Burkett, he was a surgeon, and he trained in Edinburgh, Scotland. And after his training in Edinburgh, Scotland, he left with a couple of his friends, and they went to Uganda in Africa to practice medicine. And he eventually became the head of ministries of health in Uganda. And that gave him the opportunity to oversee more than 10 million people during his 17 years as the head of the ministries of health in Uganda. And Dr. Burkett uh, told me some very fascinating stories about these people who lived in Africa. He identified their diet as high fiber. Well, I didn't realize it then, but of course I know now, as all you do, that fiber is only present in plant foods. These people lived on a high fiber diet. They ate basically plants. They ate corn and grains and vegetables. That was their diet in Uganda. And then he told me that he didn't see any of the common illnesses that we see in our country, in the United States. He didn't see heart disease. No, he said he saw one case of heart disease. There was a uh, judge who trained in London, went back to Uganda, and had a heart attack. He saw one heart attack in 17 years. Yeah, and he saw one case of gallstones in 17 years. He saw none of the common diseases that I was used to seeing in his time in Uganda. And after he learned all these things, he came back and tried to share the message with people all around the world, and he did. Very famous doctor. Had audiences all over the globe to share this very basic fundamental message of how you get well. Well, I heard this in 1971, but that was only a little glimmer of what was going on 
in my future. I just had a, a slight indication that there was something else to learn. Well, after an, Mary and I did our time in Michigan, which was about 25 years, we decided to escape. We picked, looked at all kinds of places to go that would be a little bit warmer, a little bit nicer, like Florida and Texas, and we even considered California. But that wasn't enough for us. We were really ready to change our lives. And so we left and moved to Honolulu, Hawaii. And I stayed there for a year as an intern. I was actually a surgical intern. I worked hard, learned a few things, but I fell in love with Hawaii. And I didn't want to leave. And that was in 1972, and then 1973 came along, and I was faced with either being unemployed or getting a job, and a job was offered to me on the Big Island of Hawaii. That changed my life. We moved to the Big Island of Hawaii, and I worked on a sugar plantation, and I took care of 5,000 people on this sugar plantation, and that's where I learned about being a doctor. I was basically the only doctor for 41 miles. I had to do everything. I caught 100 babies during those three years. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. Whatever was wrong with you, I had to take care of because there was nobody else there. Now, I took care of your, quote, mundane problems, like your high blood pressure and your constipation and your blood pressure and your fatness and all those things, too. And what I found out was with these chronic ailments, I couldn't help. Nobody seemed to get better. No matter how hard I tried, and I had better expectations for myself, Remember, I was raised at the age of Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare, and Marcus Welby. So I knew how a real doctor was supposed to perform. And my patients, just plain and simple, would not get well. And so I felt very frustrated as a doctor. And then the other thing that happened to me is I learned about good eating from my patients again. I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. And what I saw was a drastic difference in health as the generations changed. First generation, they'd learned a diet in the Philippines or in Japan or China, a diet of rice and vegetables, and then they moved to Hawaii for a new life on the plantation. And they kept their diet of rice and vegetables, no dairy, very little meat. But the second generation, their kids, they became influenced by Western eating, and they ate more meat, less rice. And they got a little fatter and a little sicker. By the time you got to the third generation, you could see the damaging effects of the American diet. These third generation and fourth generation Filipinos, Chinese, Chinese Japanese, and Koreans were fat and sick, just like the, the people that I learned medicine on back in Michigan. Yes. And so by the time I left in 1976, we spent three years there. We had our first two children there. By the time I left, I was pretty clear about the importance of diet, all starting with Dennis Burkett opening my eyes in 1971. It wasn't until I came back from 20 years surgical practice in Africa that I was helped largely by others to appreciate that most of the common chronic diseases filling the hospital beds in Western countries today are rare or unknown in the Third World, were rare even in North America before the First World War, are equally common in black and white Americans, and therefore they have to be due to our lifestyle, the way we live, and in which case they've got to be preventable if we can identify the factors in our lifestyle. So when you talk about lifestyle, when you talk about things being different in different parts of the planet, when you talk about, uh, about epidemiology and environmental diseases, the first thing you want to think about is the food. Because that's where we contact the environment is with our food. Yes, we contact it with water and air also, but that's small compared to food in terms of number of molecules that touch our body with air and the kinds of molecules. Air is just, what, carbon dioxide, water, a little nitrogen, a few pollutants. Water, that's supposed to be just H2O. Food, you're talking about tens of thousands of different kinds of chemical substances and a huge amount of molecules that contact us. So when people talk about differences in disease present in different parts of the world, the first thing you have to think about is the food, as Dr. Dennis Burkert was telling us. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world, 
who don't get the common diseases of Western culture. And when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, nervous tissue disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet with far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. Dr. Burkett, I remember when he gave that noontime presentation, he showed a slide. This is the best I can remember that slide from 1971. <laughs> what he showed is a slide which uh, represented a small bowel movement alongside of a big hospital. The message being, if you eat a low fiber diet, you're going to get both. You're going to get small bowel movements, and you're going to have a sick population of people. And those people who had big bowel movements, they had need for very little medicine and very little hospitals. Again, fiber means plants. Fiber is only present in plant foods. There's no fiber in cheese, in beef, pork, chicken, fish, none at all. So the makeup of the stool being primarily affected by dietary fiber is a message that he focused on a lot. But he understood the difference. In the interview I did with him in 1990 at Loma Linda University, he talked about, he understood it wasn't just fiber. He knew that it was plants. He knew that it was starch. He mentioned starch here, didn't he? Starch being the sugar that's in this, the plants that I recommend to you, the rice, the corn, the potatoes, and so on. He knew that the animal foods were a problem and the fats were a problem. But he was known as the fiber man. And I guess that was easier for me to, so to speak, swallow back in 1971, because it was just fiber. All I had to do was taste, take and maybe sprinkle a little bit of Miller's bran over my bacon and eggs, and everything would be fine. <laughs> but that's not what he was trying to tell me. It's just that all, that was all I was willing to listen to at that particular point in my life. It took many years before I heard the rest of his message. Well, you see, I spent years recognizing that fiber related to bowel behavior, recognizing that in people who had adequate bowel behavior, they virtually never had a lot of our Western diseases. And I really copied the example of my friend Alec Walker in South Africa, who has looked at thousands of stools. But you see, now we know from the evidence available that the average American who isn't a vegetarian only passes about 80 to 130 grams of stool a day. In people who, and elderly people under 50. Um, whereas in countries who don't get bowel cancer, breast cancer, gallstones, coronary heart disease, so on, they pass three to five hundred grams of stool a day. And I think we are genetically, as it were, coded or, or made to get on with far more fiber than we take. And I think our relationship to, well, there was always causative relationship, but our relationship to a lot of our Western diseases is related to what I might call our national constipation. So, Dr. Burkett, he's talked to you about starch. Some of you wonder why I called the book The Starch Solution, because scientifically that's the correct terminology. The source of energy that you want to get in your diet is from starch. It's complex carbohydrate, that's one way, way of describing it. But this is the, the energy source that you must focus on, just like his patients in Uganda, just like the rest of the world who is healthy and trim. They live on starch, like rice, corn, potatoes. Easily you can think of populations such as in Asia who live on rice-based diets. You think back in history, what you learned in school, you remember that the Mayans and Aztecs lived on corn. And the Incas, a little further south, they lived on potatoes until they went to battle and then they switched to quinoa. Our attention these days in the news is on the Middle East. Well, the people you see in the news in the Middle East, they're rather trim looking. Well, part of it is you might say they don't have a lot of food, but the main reason is, is these people live on rice and chickpeas. 71% of their diet is carbohydrate. And that part of the world was known as the bread basket of the world. Throughout all of human history, Almost every single person has lived on a starch-based diet. Or more generally, I can say to you, 
that all large, successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils. It's only when people become rich that they abandon the starch and they get into the meat and dairy. Just to be practical in terms of everyday foods that people yeah. eat, can you name a few foods that you'd like to see people eat more of? Oh yes, oh yes. I think we ought to eat far more foods made of cereals in general, particularly bread. Our ancestors ate between a pound, about a pound and a quarter per head per day of bread, always brown flour. We in Europe, in England, eat under a quarter of a pound a day. I think bread is a, a brown bread, not white bread, brown or wholemeal bread is a very healthy diet. I like to see. Now, peas and beans are extraordinarily good because they're high in soluble fiber which is good from the point of view of diabetes and coronary heart disease. I think potatoes are very good. They're high in potassium. And Western man is the only mammal alive who eats more uh, sodium than potassium. I think potatoes, as long as they are neither cooked or eaten with fat, are a slimming diet. They are very nutritious. They tell me that there's almost no other diet which can't, contains almost everything a human being uh, needs. I could emphasize that I know through studying the scientific literature and experiments that have been done in the early 1900s and late 1800s, they actually took people and they raised them on diets of potatoes and water alone. And they thrived for six months, a year and a half. Probably in natural situations, people have thrived for much longer than that in uh, Russia and in Poland are just two examples where that's all people had during difficult times was potatoes. And what I want to emphasize is a simple diet is very nutritious. As Dr. Burkett said, people can live on potatoes and water alone. You can live on grains and beans, but you have to add a little bit of fruit or vegetable for vitamin C. Like you could live on rice with a slice or two of orange or a flower out of bro uh, broccoli. You do just fine. As far as uh, the things that people are worried about, now some of you who are new to this, I'm sure you're sitting and thinking to yourself, oh boy, this is completely different than everything I hear now and have heard of in the past. And then your next thoughts after Dr. Burke and I have shocked you with the idea that you need to live on potatoes and bread and corn and rice, just like everybody else has. The next thing you're thinking to yourself, well, that can't be. How can I get necessary calcium and protein if I don't include dairy? and meat, words synonymous with calcium and protein. You know, you're talking about a vegetarian diet. Now say we consider the ideal diet a vegetarian diet, can you think of any reasons to add meat to that diet? No, no need, no need to. How no. about dairy products? Any reason to add dairy well, products to the diet? Well, some people would say that if you add dairy products, you're, you've got to get, you're, you'll have your vitamin B12, you're less likely to get pernicious anemia. And see, there were relatively few in England vegans. There's a lot of vegetarians, but very few vegans. I don't think um, a vegetarian diet is a healthy diet. I, I wouldn't be able, I, I wouldn't be authoritative to talk on the diet with no milk or eggs, but certainly a vegetarian diet can be a very, very healthy diet. It's been the diet of the, most of the Japanese throughout history, and they have the longest life expectancy of any country in the world. So you don't consider calcium an issue as far as dairy products? No, because communities who don't drink milk at all after childhood suffer almost not at all from osteoporosis in old age. But you don't see people in an African village walking around with their chin on their chest from osteoporosis. And age adjusted and Africans in South Africa have only one eleventh the risk of getting femoral neck fractures. And they have a lower calcium intake in their diet than we have. So whatever it is, I, don't, I doubt whether taking calcium tablets really does much help. About this same time, uh, there were other people who were trying to make a difference in this country. Uh, like uh, Governor um, McGovern, George McGovern, and he got together, oh, excuse me, Senator McGovern, Senator McGovern, South Dakota, right? 
yeah, Senator McGovern, he uh, uh, was uh, uh, in, in the Senate at that time, and his interest was trying to make America a better place. You know, there are senators who do try and do this. <laughs> they try and help us have a better life. I mean, that's their job, is to try and make a better life for people. And he realized that uh, people were getting sick because of the foods that we were eating. And I know that one of the efforts of Senator McGovern was, uh, Senator George McGovern, was to uh, make people healthier, similar to the way that uh, the Surgeon General of 1964 made people healthier by publishing the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. So he wanted to do the same thing for Americans with another uh, governmental action, and this would be a Senate Select Committee on Nutrition that would look at the available evidence, and as a result of looking at the evidence, they would make recommendations. And so they put out, in February of 1977, they put out the Dietary Goals for the United States 36 years ago. And uh, part of that Dietary Goals is a, a statement by Dr. Mark Hegstead. And Dr. Mark Hickstead said in this 1977 document, there's a great deal of evidence and it continues to accumulate, which strongly implicates in some instances proves that the major causes of death and disability in the United States are related to the diet we eat. I include coronary artery disease, which accounts for nearly half of the deaths in the United States, several of the most important forms of cancer, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, as well as other chronic diseases. 1977. And then the report went on and it said, the question to be asked, therefore, is not why should we change our diet, but why not? What are the risks associated with eating less meat, less fat, less saturated fat, less cholesterol, less sugar, less salt, more fruits, vegetables, unsaturated fat, cereal products, especially whole grain cereals? There are none that can be identified and important benefits can be expected. Ischemic heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension are the diseases that kill us. They are epidemic in our population. We cannot afford to temporize. We have an obligation to inform the public of the current state of knowledge and to assist the public in making the correct food choices. To do, le to do less is to avoid our responsibility. And that lasted for a few months until the meat and dairy industry put their pressures on our government and made them change the dietary goals before the end of 1977. It is the responsibility of the government at all levels to take the initiative in creating for Americans an appropriate nutritional atmosphere, one conducive to the improvement of health and the quality of American life.